Okay, hello everybody. It is four o'clock here in Napa Valley. I'm coming to you live from my house uh, here in St. Helena. And uh, I am Aaron Pott, the winemaker, consulting winemaker for Blackbird Vineyards. And I want to welcome you all to uh, this, our, I think it's our fourth um, virtual tasting. And uh, today we're gonna taste three fun wines. First, I wanna start out giving you an idea of what's going on in the vineyards in Napa Valley right now. Um, we've just uh, started flowering in most of the Bordeaux varieties. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet Franc are all starting to flower in the cooler areas. Uh, we had a bit of rain this past weekend and uh, that may affect some of that flowering by creating uh, clusters that have uh, fewer berries on them. Uh, few of the fewer of the flowers will become uh, berries. So uh, that may be a problem for yields in the future, but we've had such uh, high yields in California in 2018 and good yields in 2019 as well, that that shouldn't be a huge concern for us. Uh, temperatures this week are gonna go very hot. Um, so everyone is preparing their vineyards for uh, high 90s uh, Fahrenheit temperatures. Um, which uh, aren't uh, all that damaging uh, to the vines at this point. The vines will shut down. Uh, they'll close their little stomata and uh, stop respiring um, when temperatures get over about 96 degrees. Uh, so they'll sort of slow down and that may also prevent uh, flowering in, in a way. But we will see, uh, we're hoping hoping for a good flower and uh, a good season this year. So far, so good. I have to say, uh, here at my house, we have uh, a new crop of baby rabbits that have arrived uh, 10 days ago. And there are five little baby rabbits that are super cute. <coughs> Uh, but they seem to be attracting a lot of flies. So you might, you might see a lot of flies buzzing around me uh, for this tasting. Um, state of the winery, uh, we're, getting ready to, uh, we're getting ready to bottle a lot of the red wines from 2018. So um, that is uh, exciting, putting together some of those blends. I'm working with uh, Kyle, the the winemaker at Blackbird to put together those blends and uh, that's coming along swimmingly. There's some wonderful wines. 2018 was a fabulous, fabulous vintage and uh, produced some of the best wines uh, that I've ever had from Napa. So it's, uh, we're very excited about the vintage, very excited about the freshness of those wines. Uh, very, uh, low volatile acidities, uh, nice uh, acidity itself, but very fresh wines. And I, I think you're gonna love them. They're, uh, they're big and bold, but not tiring, very fresh. Uh, fresh, exciting. Um, so let's start. Uh, I think we're gonna start with the dissonance. Uh, this is, oh, well, we have, we have a guest star, special guest star. This is one of our little baby rabbits. Uh, this is my youngest daughter, Isolde, and uh, she is Dumpling. the proud breeder of this rabbit uh, named Dumpling. And uh, very excited about that. But so if you see those flies, that, that's what's drawing in the flies. Uh, so we'll start with the dissonance. Uh, this is a 2019 dissonance. Um, it's a it's the latest bottling for us, and uh, we should twist that top and get right into it. Oh, that looks pretty color. It's just like shimmering. It's lovely. Okay, so this blend is 87% uh, Sauvignon Blanc and 13% Semillon. 
And uh, the Sauvignon Blanc, uh, I think, is a more common variety for people. Uh, it's thought to have originated in the Loire Valley of France. For those of you that are not familiar with the geography of France, the Loire Valley essentially splits France in half and uh, that it's a very beautiful and very major river uh, for France. And um, along the banks of the Loire uh, during the medieval period, uh, there were many beautiful castles built and it was sort of the center of uh, where the kings uh, during that time lived, uh, especially our um, important for us guy, Charles VII great, of the great kings of France. Anyway, uh, it, it's a very old uh, variety, uh, Sauvignon Blanc. It um, was first cited in chapter 25 of uh, Rabelais, Francois Rabelais' uh, Gargantua, a very famous book, uh, as an aid to constipation. So uh, there are all sorts of values to uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, I, ha I didn't know about the aid to constipation, but that's, uh, that's good to know. And that was in 1534. So uh, clearly Sauvignon Blanc goes uh, much earlier than that and uh, has been around for a long time. We'll learn when we talk a little bit about uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, we'll learn a little bit more about the mysteries of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, it's a genetic sibling to both Chenin Blanc and Trousseau. Chenin Blanc, of course, the other famous white grape of the Loire Valley. Uh, and as I said, it's also the mother of Cabernet Sauvignon. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. And something that uh, uh, is uh, closely associated with myself. So. I want to talk about that, but we're going to talk about that when we get to the red wines. Uh, so Sauvignon Blanc generally, it's uh, aromas of uh, grass, acacia flower, gooseberry, boxwood, uh, Texas ruby red grapefruit, uh, passion flower. It can be flinty. Um, a lot of the aromatics from Sauvignon Blanc, they come from uh, thiols and thiols are sulfur-containing compounds. There's a great uh, professor in Bordeaux at the Faculté d'Enologie at the University of Bordeaux too, that uh, was named Denis Dubordieu. And he did a lot of research into the aromatic compounds of uh, Sauvignon Blanc and found that a lot of these compounds were based on these thiols, these sulfur-containing uh, chemicals and they um, they are easily oxidized. So he started really showing people how to protect Sauvignon Blanc from oxidation and uh, maintain a lot of these wonderful flavors. Uh, and he was a very very cool dude. Unfortunately, uh, left us way too early, and uh, he was a very handsome handsome professor. Uh, very popular with the, the young students. But uh, he also made great Sauvignon Blanc himself. Uh, and his work um, was very important, especially his work on thiols that uh, was completed in the 90s and was very influential to me. This particular Sauvignon Blanc comes from our vineyard um, owned by Lee Hudson, Hudson Vineyard in Carneros. Uh, it's really uh, as cool a climate as you can get in, uh, in the Napa Valley, uh, not at altitude. It's uh, closest to the bay, so uh, influenced by the fog of the bay. And uh, that fog, uh, as we've said before, allows us to grow grapes uh, in, in Napa Valley, especially these, uh, these varieties that need much cooler climates. Uh, Lee is a wonderful character. I've been working with his vineyard since 1990, so we're on our 30th, uh, we're on year 30 now. Um, but I started working with his vineyards uh, for Chardonnay 
in uh, in 1990 with Newton Vineyards, and uh, we developed the Newton unfiltered Chardonnay, um, and most of that was based on vineyards that Lee had planted to Chardonnay. And Lee really got inspired uh, to plant Pinot Noir and uh, Chardonnay Burgundian varieties uh, because of his work at Domaine du Jacques in, uh, in Maurice Saint-Denis in France. And um, he was uh, hired as an intern there and learned uh, everything about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from the very amiable owner of Domaine du Jacques, uh, Jacques Cesse. Uh, when he came back, he looked for a property to grow those varieties and uh, found a 2,000 acre property in Carneros, just a fabulous place um, full of oak forests and hills and uh, wonderful vineyard uh, land. So mainly a soil called hair clay loam that's kind of the common soil of, uh, of the Carneros area. It's gravelly. Uh, it has clay and we've talked about before that clay in all its forms, if it can be dry, uh, not waterlogged, it will give wines uh, power and uh, great density and structure. And so uh, we want to find clay sites for wines, but we want to find them where they're dry. And that's often a hard uh, thing to do. But uh, Lee's site is a very dry, beautiful slope uh, going down to a creek uh, that, and that creek then goes straight up to some very dramatic uh, rolling hills that are uh, and very steeply, uh, um, very steeply sloped. And those dramatic hills uh, surround his property and there are uh, wonderful chanterelle mushrooms growing in there. There's lots of uh, lots of predatory birds in the area, hawks and so on. And uh, we originally started working with Lee to plant a, a piece that would grow uh, Bordeaux varieties, red Bordeaux varieties, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, and uh, a small amount of Cabernet Sauvignon. And we had a place that was rocky, that was much cooler, that was really influenced more by that creek down at the bottom of the vineyard and uh, we planted um, Sauvignon Blanc in that section uh, in hopes to create this cool climate Sauvignon Blanc and that's the real uh, that's the real backbone of, of this wine. The other part of the wine is 13% uh, Semillon. Uh, that may be a variety that's the people are less familiar with. Uh, Semillon is uh, of course the variety of Sauterne wines, the sweet wines that come uh, from France and uh, that that's where it gets its greatest expression but there are many dry versions of uh, Semillon as well and it's a very funny name Semillon and the name of the grape uh, comes from the village of saint uh, and no Semillon is grown in Saint Emilion. In fact, uh, there is very there are very few white grapes in Saint Emilion at all. Saint Emilion is the sort of spiritual home of Merlot and Cabernet Franc, and to a lesser extent uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. But really known for its Merlot, and uh, it's a village uh, that was first planted to grapes in 56 BC. So by the Romans, the Romans established a, an outpost there. It was then uh, a hermit, uh, Emilion, that came to live there and uh, really founded the city that uh, grew to prosper in medieval times. And uh, just to note, uh, it is on the French part of the uh, Camino de Santiago de Campostol, and that's going to become important later on in this tasting. So uh, remember that it's part of that uh, that famous uh, road to Santiago de Campostol. 
uh, famous pilgrimage walk. Uh, so Semillon comes from the word saint uh, It's uh, aromatics and flavors are, are unusual. It's, it's much more viscous on the palate. It has uh, less acidity. It seems fatter and richer than Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, it's lemon or uh, lanolin kind of waxy character. Uh, waxy aromas, uh, honey is often a character we get from Semillon. And this 13% uh, in the dissonance, it comes from, um, comes from a vineyard in Knights Valley, and it's a vineyard called Bavarian Lion Vineyard. And uh, uh, Knights Valley is just, just to the north and a little west of Napa Valley. Uh, some of you may know Peter Michael Winery, which is uh, right next door to Bavarian Lion. Uh, Bavarian Lion is a very old vineyard. It's a huge property, a third of which is planted to grapes and the rest of it's uh, wild land, uh, which allows uh, the vineyard to be a little more isolated. It's the uh, ancient bed of the Russian River. At one point in time, the Russian River came through Knights Valley and came into the Napa Valley. And uh, the Russian River came out where essentially the city of Napa is now. So it's these massive uh, cobbles um, that make up the vineyard. You know, a lot, a lot of deep, uh, deep cobble soils uh, that have been uh, rolled over the years by this ancient river going through there. The area really first came to prominence uh, in the late 1960s when a very famous geologist, uh, Henri Angelbert, came from, uh, came from Bordeaux uh, to visit the area and he was brought over by uh, Beringer Vineyards and he uh, did a geological survey of the area and found out that it was just a wonderful soil to grow grapes on. And so a lot of the plantings in that area were because of this very, uh, very legendary and famous uh, geologist, Henri Angelbert. Uh, the vineyard itself is owned by the Eret family. Uh, Pierre is the, uh, the, um, owner. Uh, he is originally from Dusseldorf uh, by way of Berlin. He uh, studied, uh, did his MBA in Fontainebleau in France and so has a very international, uh, uh, international resume before he came to Knights Valley. Uh, the dissonance itself is uh, fermented in three different containers. Uh, firstly, stainless steel. Uh, we ferment some of these wines in stainless steel tanks. Um, that allows us to really maintain that uh, lack of oxidation that we need to get um, to get that incredible uh, incredible thiol aroma that I was talking about uh, uh, talking about earlier. And the next thing we use is uh, barrels. Uh, mostly barrels that are neutral, that don't have any, any wood aromatics anymore, uh, but are, uh, leave a nice flavor and they're very nice to, um, very nice to, to make wines in, especially Sauvignon Blanc. And there's uh, less oxidation, uh, less oxidation than, um, the, to again to promote those thiol characters. Lastly, uh, one of the my one of my personal favorite ways to ferment Sauvignon Blanc is uh, we use amphora, and these are clay amphora. They're made by a producer outside of Florence called uh, Gusmano Manetti, and uh, the Manetti family is the owner of Fontodi Vineyards in Italy, and. Um, they use a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, those amphora in their wines as well. But the the amphora bring a mineral character to the wines. They give a little more oxidation during the age.
aging process uh, to the wines, uh, make them fuller. They're wonderful for Semillon. I f you find wonderful viscous Semillon coming out of those and fabulous density and so on. Let's taste this thing. I've been waiting to taste this the whole time. I've been blabbing away and you guys have been enjoying this thing probably. I mean, the first thing you, you get from this is the classic, uh, classic Sauvignon Blanc. And what I love about our Sauvignon Blanc uh, and um, what is uh, often hard for people to get from Sauvignon Blanc is we leave a lot of the lees on these wines for a while and it generates this, these wonderful reduction aromas. Remember that reduction is the opposite of oxidation. So you get these really dynamic files. And uh, the first impression is uh, a, one of uh, Pecorino cheese. It's, you have a, just a slight wonderful kind of Pecorino cheese, and then you have the lemon behind, the passion fruit. Uh, I get the grapefruit character. It's really very citrusy. It's no kind of grass. It's really a lot of a lot of fruity characters, but then side by side with that marvelous kind of pecorino character, really beautiful passion fruit too, and a little little gooseberry. Not a lot. Little acacia flower too. Hmm. I've given up on spitting. It's just too hard. Oh, it's so, it's so long, this wine. It's really, it has a wonderful acidity that continues through. You get the viscosity of that semillon on the mid palate, get great honey and length from that, that semillon. It sort of carries the wine, but also you have the acidity, the uh, rigidity of the Sauvignon Blanc that gives the wine freshness and makes it uh, makes it youthful and lovely. Oh, it's a beautiful aroma. It really, really opens up nicely, You're getting some more melon, uh, cantaloupe, honeydew. Great, pretty, pretty wine. Hmm. Okay. We have to move on. I could stay drinking that uh, forever, but yeah, we just absolutely. Oh, you're going to take it? Yeah. My wife is jumping in there to. Never let grab a good some. wine go to waste. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, next. Uh, Airy Vist. And this is the 2019 rose. I forgot to mention dissonance is really, uh, I think the name is brilliant dissonance because. Uh, we started Blackbird really, it was all about Merlot and uh, Dissonance was the first white wine that we did. And so it's, uh, the Dissonance is uh, from the Merlot, we have this white, we go from the super black grape to these super white grapes. And so that's, that's where we get the Dissonance from. Very funny. But so another funky name, Erivist, uh, or Erivist, as most people say. Uh, Erivist is a, it's a rosé, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but I just want to get, get uh, the name first, because I think it's a very funny name. And so I've uh, brought out my French dictionary, and this is what every, uh, every kid in France would have one of these on their desk. You can see mine is a super old one, the, the 2000 version. Um, and so this is like a, a high school kids dictionary that you would get. So I'm going to go to Eriviste and it says here, Personne qui veut réussir à tout prix. Ambitieux sans scrupule. Okay, so what does that mean? It means a person that uh, wants to succeed at all, at any price. And uh, they're ambitious without, scrupule, without scruples. Uh, that doesn't sound very good, <laughs> but uh, to succeed at any price, I think is uh, what we're going for with this guy. And um, the story of this is quite funny. Um, our founder, Michael Polensky, uh, so wanted to make a rosé. And um, he wanted to link 
the idea of a rosé up with the idea of Blackbird Merlot. And so uh, we had always had this kind of idea that uh, Blackbird uh, was a Napa Valley wine that uh, had a right bank uh, influence. So right bank meaning Saint-Emilion, Pomerol, the right bank of the, of the Gironde River. Uh, so we, um, we decided that uh, the idea would be, uh, had to be founded in Saint-Emilion somehow or another. And uh, one, one thing that I thought of during this time was that we would uh, often have, uh, have workers come in to harvest the grapes and they were mainly gypsies. Uh, and this was when I was working as the winemaker at trollant in Saint-Emilion. And at trollant we had a lot of gypsy workers and by law in France, uh, when somebody works the harvest, they are, uh, allowed one liter of wine per day, no matter how old they are. And uh, at the end of the day after picking, uh, we would still be working in the cellar, taking care of the grapes, and there would uh, start to be a line forming outside of the cellar door. And this line would be all of the harvest workers and any uh, kids that they could find and babies and each one would be holding a plastic bottle that had uh, very um, clearly written on it where the one liter mark was. And usually it was a little bit, <laughs> a little bit cheating. Uh, and so you would have this one liter. Oh, there's a, uh, funnily enough, there's a picture of me in the cellar at Trollomando. So this would have been 1994. Uh, that's when I had hair. And um, I'm working there with my good friend, Adrienne, behind me. And that arm you see is my good friend, Dries Schweid. And uh, we're racking barrels. Uh, and if uh, what, racking means you're taking the barrels, uh, the clean wine off, off the dirt, dirty wine that ends up at the bottom and uh, moving in, them into different barrels. And it was a very complex process at that time, all done by hand. But uh, anyway, so the gypsies would wait outside the cellar door for their liter of wine, and we would give them a liter of the, of the rosé that we made the year before. And uh, they were more than happy with that. And so I told Michael this story, and he loved the story, especially the part when the uh, gypsy... Um, wine drinkers would get very drunk and uh, have a huge bonfire and play guitars all night long and pretty much keep us awake. It was nice to have that when you were uh, working late, very late in the winery, but uh, you would walk past it about midnight and it would look to get a bit outrageous and uh, prevented us from sleeping often. But anyway, it was a wonderful um, part of the the beauty of harvest, the folly of harvest as well, and the craziness that happens during that time. And so we decided to call, uh, we decided to make that part of the rosé story. And so that gave us our excuse to make uh, the Riviste. And uh, this is a wine that's uh, what we call a rosé of saigné, and saigné means to bleed. Um, and uh, what, how we make this wine is we take uh, the red wines, when, they, when we put the grapes to tank, uh, we uh, take out a little bit of the juice and it runs pretty pink. You know, you have to have red skins uh, in the juice to create the red wine. And that comes, the color only comes after about three days of maceration. Uh, and uh, so it takes a while to extract the color from the skins. And uh, so you bleed the juice out and it's pink. And we take that and we ferment it aside. And uh, the red wine gets, has less juice in it and more skins and more seeds to juice ratio. So that makes the red wine more concentrated 
and then the byproduct is this rosé. So it's part of what makes the the red wines at Blackbird so good, but it's also a wonderful byproduct of that. And so we make this, it's mainly uh, focused on Cabernet Franc and Merlot. Luckily we have those wonderful aromatic varieties. Cabernet Franc and Merlot are great varieties to make uh, rosé out of. And so we, we use uh, quite a lot of Cabernet Franc and, and Merlot in this to make this rosé. So, uh, cheers. Hmm. Yeah, it's very, very bright fruits. Beautiful, uh, beautiful nose. There's a lot of citrus right now in this. I mean, it's like an orange and um, a little bit of lime. There's almost, there's like a, just a little, a little touch of caramel in the nose too. That's quite pretty. Mm, very fresh. Pretty uh, blue fruits too, a little blueberry. I, I imagine that comes from the, comes from the Cabernet Franc. It's a very common Cabernet Franc aroma, but nice freshness. Mm. Oh, you really, it, it's very fruity on the, on the palate. You kind of get, it's like every fruit, you know, <laughs> you, you get all of these, these wonderful, uh, wonderful citrus fruits, lemon, lime. Uh, there's also a little melon there. It's, um, it's very, Full of, I mean, it's just like a fruit bowl, you know. There's strawberries and and so on. Uh, good length. It's um, bright acidity. I mean, it really m maintains that acidity throughout the palate. I, again, it's super fresh. I mean, I'm loving these wines because of their freshness. 19 is a vintage where we had uh, we had very cool days. There were barely any days uh, over 100 degrees and most of them fell outside of the period uh, between Veraison and harvest which is the real crucial period. Veraison is when the when the grapes change color and soften and so it's a it can be a very tough period for uh, grapes because uh, if they're affected by heat uh, that can be uh, that can be devastating for for grapes at that point. They dry out. They uh, produce too much sugar. They can be unripe at very high sugar levels and produce a lot of alcohol. But 19 is a vintage where you have wonderful conditions uh, for growing grapes and uh, produce wines with beautiful acidity. And this is one of them. Hmm, I'm gonna have another sip. Cheers, everybody. Mm. So I hate to pour that out. I'll sneak it past my wife there. Okay. Lastly, and uh, we've got a lot going on with this one. Uh, you are only waiting for this moment to arise. Uh, Blackbird fly. Okay. Uh, this is arise. And uh, for those of you that are musical, you can see our little blackbirds on the, on the electrical wires there. Also mimic the notes of the uh, song Blackbird by the Beatles. And uh, for those of you that know me, I've uh, been a Beatles fan since I was a little kid. And that's uh, made me a, uh, Liverpool football club fan, so I don't want to offend anybody there, but anyway, an aside, but these are the musical notes of Blackbird Arise, and this guy is arising here. Um, so I've got this band-aid on, I cut my finger the other day, and it is, it's a uh, Black Panther band-aid, so uh, Wakanda forever, thanks to my daughter. Anyway, let's get to this Arise. So this is 2017 vintage. Uh, nobody in Napa Valley will ever forget the 2017 vintage.
crazy vintage. Um, we had a great vintage um, up until September, really, and then uh, things turned very hot. Uh, it was uh, a vintage where we had a lot of 100 plus days uh, coupled with very low humidity. Um, so we had uh, several days that were over 100 degrees and, uh, and at single digit humidity. So that's, I mean, unheard of. And that and a lot of wind led to the epic fires that we had in 2017. So very difficult, uh, difficult vintage and uh, complex. I think that um, one of the things that spared us was that we had uh, we had mainly Merlot and Cabernet Franc in in this wine, and both of those uh, both of those from cooler climates ripened before the fires happened uh, on October eighth, and uh, so we were able to pick before those fires. Um, which uh, allowed us not to get smoke taint in the wines, which was one of the great dangers of, of the 2017 vintage. And I was quite happy with that. Uh, it was um, difficult for Merlot, I think, more than for Cabernet Franc because of the low humidity. Uh, Merlot is a variety that loves humidity and uh, it can be very difficult. This particular wine is 43% um, Merlot, and uh, Merlot is why Blackbird exists. In fact, the, the word Merlot is derived uh, from the French word uh, for Blackbird, which is a Merle. And um, it's funny, French comes uh, from, uh, in France, uh, Early on, there were two languages. Uh, one was called the Languedoc, long means tongue or language, and uh, one was called the Languedoc, and that was the language of the north, and the other was called the Languedoc, or Occitan, which is what they call it uh, today. And oi and ak were the words for yes in both of those languages, and Languedoc became French, and Languedoc became uh, Catalan now. I mean, it's more, more of the words are used in the, in the, in the Catalan language uh, than in any other. Uh, so the word in Occitan or Languedoc uh, for Blackbird is Merlot, spelled with an A-U. So that's interesting. So, uh, both languages have a lot of commonality in them, but uh, that's where we derive this word Merlot. It's, uh, Merlot is a natural cross between Cabernet Franc and a super obscure grape called Madeleine Noir de Charente. And uh, Madeleine Noir de Charente is also the mother of uh, Malbec, the grape Malbec. Uh, so those, uh, those two grapes, Merlot and Malbec, are uh, half siblings. Uh, Merlot's classic, uh, it's heavy, rich, sweet velvet, you know, tannins are soft, uh, plum, iris, cherries are sort of the uh, characteristic aromatics of, of Merlot. And we have 43% in here. 42% is Cabernet Franc. And uh, Cabernet Franc's a, it's one of my personal favorite varieties. I love Merlot, but I, I have a little extra love for Cabernet Franc. Uh, and it's, um, I, I find it an amazing, the history of it is amazing. It's um, really comes from the uh, Basque country in France and Spain. And it's, was founded in the 12th century collegiate church of uh, Rancevaux, uh, just on the French side of the Spanish border. And as I said before, Rancevaux is on the Camino 
the Santiago de Campostol. Uh, so everywhere you go on the Camino de Santiago de Campostol, pretty much everywhere in France you go, you find, uh, you find Cabernet Franc. Uh, Aruligui, uh, the region in the Basque country, uh, you have Cabernet Franc. Uh, Bordeaux, uh, which is on the, on the road in, uh, in France, pilgrims pass through there, they drop off cuttings, you have it in Bordeaux. Saint-Emilion, the church in Saint-Emilion, very famous church uh, uh, founded by the hermit, um, Saint, uh, the hermit Emilion, who became a saint, of course, is uh, also on that uh, road, uh, Campo Stol. You go up uh, Saumur, Chinon, Bourgueil in the Loire Valley. They are also on the Camino de Santiago de Campo Stol. So you have all of these pilgrims dropping off cuttings of Cabernet Franc along this road and uh, creating uh, all of these wonderful regions. I mean, we really think about Cabernet Franc coming from, uh, from Saint-Emilion, from Pomerol, but it's a tiny, tiny little part of the Cabernet Franc story. There's more Cabernet Franc, uh, more Cabernet Franc wines in the Loire Valley. There's more Cabernet Franc wines in the Medoc in Bordeaux. There's more Cabernet Franc wines in the Rulagui as well. So, but uh, there is proof of the existence of Cabernet Franc as early as 1050, 1050, the year 1050, thousand years ago, Cabernet Franc uh, existed back then. So it's a, it's a very old variety. There's a lot of um, people that believe that the older the variety, the more closely it's related to its wild parentage, the more closely it's related to wild vines that just grew in forests in uh, Europe, and the more it shows where it's from. And uh, I believe that for me, Cabernet Franc is one of those varieties that more than anything else shows uh, that it's from what what soils it's grown on, what climate it's grown in. Uh, Cabernet Franc that's too ripe is is unpleasant. Cabernet Franc that's underripe is green and unpleasant. So it it shows the climate it's com it comes from. It shows the uh, soil that it comes from. There are a few soils in Napa Valley that are great Cabernet Franc soils. Probably a handful, four soils that are really good for Cabernet Franc. And, uh, and then you have the multiple climates in Napa Valley that make it very complex to grow Cabernet Franc here. So there's uh, only a handful of sites that uh, grow it very well. Luckily, luckily I own one. Um, so it's the father of both Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. So the two kind of most prominent uh, Bordeaux varieties uh, come from uh, a relationship with Cabernet Franc um, and those varieties were created by crosses that were natural crosses. They weren't um, influenced by humans. Uh, natural crossing, uh, probably by birds or insects or whatever, created these, uh, these varieties and they were just selected by humans because of uh, different characteristics. Cabernet Franc's very aromatic. I, the sort of hallmark characters of it are cedar, blueberry, tobacco. Uh, if it's not ripe, it can be very herbaceous. I mean, dry leaf pile is often the characteristic of Cabernet Franc. Uh, there's a danger of growing it in uh, areas that are too cold. Violets also, Cabernet, very Cabernet Franc characteristic. So this is, again, 42% Cabernet Franc. Uh, it's also 10% Cabernet Sauvignon. Cabernet Sauvignon, the king. The king Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, I mean, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, be because of this, it's a recent cross. Um, and th this is interesting. It's a natural cross, as I said, between Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc, 
believe it or not. I mean, this white variety creates this red wine of incredible power, and that's where it gets its name. Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon. Seems like a great marketing idea. But um, this, uh, this was found out uh, by the great grapevine geneticist, uh, Dr. Carol Meredith, working with, uh, with a guy, John Bowers, in 1997. And this was really uh, groundbreaking work. Um, Carol found uh, the origin of this grape variety and it was the first time that we really used genetics to find out where something was from in the grapevine world. And uh, Carol has since found so many other mysteries and de debunked so many other uh, ridiculous wine stories uh, with her incredible research. And I uh, am very happy to say that Dr. Carol Meredith is a 30, a friend for 30 plus years and uh, my next door neighbor on Mount Veter. Um, and they grow wonderful grapes uh, in, on a property next door to mine and make a wine under the Legere Meredith label. If you haven't tried it, you should try it. They're wonderful wine. But one of the smartest people I know, and I say that uh, without hesitation, very brilliant woman. And um, Carol and her husband, Steve, are incredible. Very good friends. But uh, she found out where a lot of these great varieties come from, and uh, especially Cabernet Sauvignon. So really, this would have occurred, this natural cross would have occurred in about 1700. Uh, it would have been somewhere in the Bordeaux area. It's from the Gironde uh, area in southwestern France. Cabernet Sauvignon is really the classic characteristics, black currant, blackberry, boysenberry, clove, green pepper when it's not, uh, uh, doesn't get enough sun exposure. Uh, the wines can be monolithic, austere, uh, they can have a lot of tannin, and they can need a lot of time uh, to soften, or uh, we can blend them with other grapes. Uh, Merlot is a great grape to soften out Cabernet Sauvignon because of those wonderful velvety tannins. Also Cabernet Franc uh, that has a massive mid palate uh, can be wonderful to fill in what we call uh, Cabernet Sauvignon's uh, donut characteristics. Cabernet Sauvignon is really intense in its attack. The sort of first impression of wine that you get is that attack and uh, it can be very intense, very uh, richly structured and then the finish is very intense but the mid palate can be uh, can be so structured that it can can be kind of non-existent <laughs> and so that Cabernet Franc really fills in that donut hole and makes uh, makes Cabernet Sauvignon more pleasing, more round. Uh, the last grape in here is uh, Petit Verdot. There's 5% of Petit Verdot. Uh, yes, there is a Gros Verdot. Uh, petit meaning little, Gros meaning fat, but yes, there is a variety called Gros Verdot. Uh, the word Verdot uh, is derived from uh, Vert or green, in French. Uh, Petit Verdot is uh, in its own ample, ampelographic class uh, family. It doesn't have any, uh, doesn't have any relationship to, to Cabernet Sauvignon or other Bordeaux varieties. It has, it's from its own weird school and uh, often it, it's yet to be discovered where, uh, where it really originates from. Um, it's deep colored, deeply colored, uh, tannic, uh, good acidity. Um, oftentimes you get that wonderful India ink aroma. It can be very floral at times, uh, and, and lovely. So, uh, a lot of different vineyards went into the making of this one. I think I'm going to pour myself a glass of it because I'm getting very thirsty though. 
Uh, so the 2017 Arise, going into my glass. Ooh, look at that. Wonderful color, beautiful. It's a little bit of that Petit Verdot giving us that color. Look at that. Fabulous. I gotta put, put something behind it, but you can't really see, but very deeply colored. Hmm. First thing you get is that, I mean, just the tobacco, uh, very strong, wonderful tobacco aroma. And it's that sweet, you know, uh, like a tobacco dryer or a, a cigar box. You know, you get that cedar, the tobacco. That's a, a lot of that coming from the combination of the Cabernet Franc and the, the Cabernet Sauvignon. Blackberry, boysenberry, plum. And sherry, I mean, you can go on, it just oozes out of the glass. So um, let me talk a little bit about the vineyards uh, before I take it. Well, let me take it. Let me take a sip first. Let me have that at least. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's very nice. I mean, very deep, very coffee, uh, toffee characters, a little kind of toasted almond in there. A lot of fruit on the mid palate. A um, little bit of cherry, a uh, little, little dried cherry almost, uh, boysenberry. Oh, it's very caramel. That the toffee is very intense. Coffee in the aroma too. Mm. It's smooth as silk though. It's, I mean, you really, the Merlot is really coming out in the, in the finish, very smooth, very light on its feet. It's not a, it's not a super rich, overly bombastic, rich wine. It's very medium bodied, uh, beautiful finish. Still going on, still going on. Uh, so a lot, a lot of different vineyards go into this and I want to talk about this because it shows you how we source grapes for, uh, for making the wines. And we, we really have, uh, we have uh, a few wines that we make. Of the red wines, there's a tiny amount of wines uh, that we call the black male wines. And uh, in the past we've made Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot and Cabernet Franc under the black male label and they're tiny, tiny production. Uh, after that, we have the three principal wines, the Illustration, which is the Merlot vehicle, the Paramour, which is the Cabernet Franc vehicle, and the Contrarian, which is the Cabernet Sauvignon vehicle. And then after that, we have the Arise. And uh, really what goes into the Arise are those wines that are really approachable, really for me, California wines. They're, uh, they're soft, they're rich, they're uh, lovely, but we try to get wines that are, that are going to be more early drinking than the principal wines that are gonna be more user friendly. I really think these wines go great with food. They're very food friendly. They have a lot of versatility in terms of the foods they go with. I mean, this guy right now, uh, you're just dying for a hamburger. I mean, be as be it as prosaic as that. Everybody loves a good hamburger, don't they? I think so. Uh, but it's got a lot of versatility. I think you could have it with pizza. You could have it with pasta. You know, it's it's not a wine that's going to be too tannic uh, to go with a lot a wide variety of foods, and it's soft uh, in the finish. So again. Back to the vineyards. Uh, Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Petit Verdot from a single property uh, called Star Vineyard. And it's a vineyard that I've worked with in Rutherford since 2001, originally owned by a guy named Reg Oliver. He developed the vineyard with two very famous Napa Valley characters. Reg Oliver developed it with uh, David Abreu, and uh, with Rick Foreman. So Rick Foreman uh, was the original winemaker at Sterling. 
uh, moved to Newton Vineyards, started his own winery, Foreman, and has been making wonderful wines his entire life and a very, uh, very great winemaker. Um, really uh, admirable wines and wonderful. Hey, oh. uh, sorry for the interruption there. A little loudness going on in the background. Uh, somebody looking for ice cubes. But anyway, uh, to continue, uh, Rick Foreman, David Abreu, David Abreu, very famous viticulturalist, uh, has his own wines, Abreu wine. They started this vineyard in Rutherford, Rutherford uh, and uh, really uh, planted everything there, but uh, quite a lot of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, funnily enough, that went into the El Molino wines that uh, Reg Oliver founded. Um, it's, it's the classic bale clay loam vineyard, uh, you know, the valley floor, these bench lands on the valley floor that are created by uh, rock and debris coming out of the hillsides on the eastern side and western side of the valley being fanned across the valley floor creating these steep benches uh, of rock and they're very good for growing grapes. Uh, another one of these is Crocker Star Vineyard. Uh, it's been in vine since 1870. It's owned by uh, Charlie Crocker and Pam Star. Uh, the famous winemaker, very good Cabernet Franc winemaker too. And uh, we get Cabernet Franc from that vineyard that's in St. Helena on the St. Helena bench land. Um, another Cabernet Franc source is the Krupp vineyard. And this is interesting. Uh, Jan, Dr. Jan Krupp was the founder of Stagecoach Vineyard, a uh, 700 acre vineyard uh, in the, on the flanks of Atlas Peak above Oakville, right above Oakville. And uh, Jan sold that property and bought another property. And uh, we contracted uh, to buy Cabernet Franc from him. And funnily enough, uh, this, it, the property is uh, just north of the city of Napa, uh, off of Hardman Avenue. And uh, there, there's a little pocket of hair clay loam, which is the same hair clay loam that we find in the Carneros area. And uh, that produces some nice Cabernet Franc. Uh, this, we also have uh, the amazing Stagecoach Vineyard. Again, Dr. Jan Krupp founded that vineyard. Uh, Cabernet Franc comes out of that vineyard. <clears throat> one, of our, one of our best parcels, this parcel M3 for Cabernet Franc. We get another parcel called I-16, which is probably the, some of the best Cabernet Franc uh, from, that, uh, from that vineyard. This is uh, Hambright soils. Uh, it flows of basalt. Uh, basaltic rock is it's very iron rich. Uh, very heavy, very dense rock. These soils are bright red. They have a lot of iron content in them. Iron generally makes for uh, interesting uh, characters in wines, gives wines a lot of, uh, creates wines with a lot of color density, a lot of structure. Uh, also in this is a, a bit of Merlot from a vineyard called Barking Dog. It's a vineyard that I was introduced to by uh, a friend and also fellow vineyard owner on Mount Veeder, a guy named John Durr, who uh, grows a lot of grapes in the Napa Valley. And uh, also we work together on a wine called Communication Block, uh, whose proceeds supported a charity that uh, helped kids that uh, had learning disabilities, both physical and mental. And uh, Barking Dog Vineyards in the middle of Coombsville, uh, the Coombsville Appalachian is a, an old caldera, essentially a you know, volcano. And uh, there's a lot of different soil types in there. This is on a little mound in the middle of this caldera, kind of in the center of it. And uh, Barking Dog is uh, Sobronte silt loam, so very fine soil. It's a metamorphic ash uh, vineyard makes very elegant, uh, elegant Merlots, very velvety structured. Uh, and then uh, 
Stagecoach Vineyard, um, Merlo from uh, a vineyard 14A and another vineyard D4. 14A, it's, uh, Stagecoach is at about 1,200 feet in altitude and it's its own kind of valley. Uh, the Napa Valley more or less runs north to south. Uh, and uh, you have this little valley at 1,200 feet that comes tees off of the Napa Valley and runs uh, west to east. And um, that, that valley is a cooler site. You have a view down to the bay. You can see both bridges, uh, Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco from the vineyards. A very high altitude vineyard. Again, that Hambrite series, the basaltic rock. Um, Merlot from uh, two different vineyards. Uh, one on the very western side of Stagecoach Vineyard and one on the very eastern side of Stagecoach Vineyard. So very different characteristics coming from those wines. So that's uh, the Arise 2017. I will continue drinking this. And uh, uh, there's a few, I see there's a few questions here. One question is, what was the name of that French dictionary? This is Le Petit Le Russe uh, French Dictionary. So kind of classic little kid's dictionary. It has all sorts of little pictures in it, you know. But uh, that's where we got the definition of a reviste. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, where is, what is Ray Ray's taco? So that's a good question, yeah. So my hat. Uh, I'm doing a lot of advertising today. I look like a NASCAR guy. But so Ray Ray's Tacos, it's a taco, uh, taco making organization. <laughs> so a woman that, um, she was uh, at the Culinary Institute of America and a great chef. She worked at the restaurant in Meadowood for a while and she loves tacos. She lived in Austin, Texas for uh, quite a while, was influenced by taco love there, and uh, decided to create all these, um, to create this Ray Ray's Tacos, and they make uh, taco kits and also sell tacos at the, well, they used to sell tacos at the uh, farmer's market in San Elena, super yummy stuff. I don't see any other questions here. So with that, I will leave you. It's so great to talk with you. I hope uh, we can see you out here in Napa Valley. We're just starting to open up. Ooh. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody. So come out, uh, come try our wonderful food, our hospitality, and I love you all. Have a great night.